their contributions and their lovely talks. And next I hand over to Tori that is going to introduce the poster sessions. Right, so thank you for the last session. It was another highlight in this conference. And I have now the honor to present the last and maybe main highlight of the conference, which is the poster awards. But before we hand out the poster awards of this year's conference, we have a premiere as promised uh, last year. We will uh, hear short talks of the winners of last year to see how their scientific projects continued. And we'll start. Um, with the first one, yesterday we heard another exciting talk of, on swarm learning by Joachim Schulze, and just like last year, so it was also kind of an update of his projects. And one of our last year's second prizes told us about the challenges and opportunities of sharing sensitive data such as genomic data and presented her solution, ProGeneGen. And I'm looking forward to seeing how your projects continued. Marie Oestreich from DZNI. Uh, yeah, how do I find my presentation? Oh, oh there. Mm -hmm. oh, there. Okay, yeah, I got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Marie Oestreich. Uh, I work here at the DZNI in Matthias's group. And um, I'm going to say a few words about ProGeneGen. Um, ProGeneGen is a Helmholtz AI project, and it regards protecting genetic data with synthetic cohorts. So the motivation behind this uh, entire project is that if we have, for example, transcriptomics data that gives us very individual level insight into the condition of an individual, then of course, um, for us, this is an incentive to share this data, maybe for finding targeted therapies or simply to expand the knowledge that we already have uh, on this particular disease. So we can share it typically in two ways, uh, either publicly on a database or directly with uh, colleagues. As you know, sharing this kind of data is uh, challenging because it's very sensitive, very personal information. Um, so we cannot just go about and share it as it is. To handle uh, these kind of situations, there are a few uh, data sharing methods in place at the moment. One is data sharing agreements, but as most of you probably know, they're very time consuming. Uh, they're complicated and they also hinder enrollment uh, of new study participants. Alternatively, you could go and say, I'm going to encrypt my data. Um, that is very safe. However, you will have large computing overheads and or so-called query budgets. So um, the user can only query so often until it's, it's blocked for, for security reasons. And lastly, what we talked about yesterday and also heard about today, uh, model sharing. So uh, keyword swarm learning, you uh, share your model instead of your data. That is a solution to this problem. However, as you can see, this so far only works for machine learning. So if you want to do some exploratory analysis um, or you want to freely share your data, not with uh, partners that you've set up in a swarm with, you need a complementary approach to the model sharing. And that is exactly where ProGeneGen comes in. So we have um, our real set of data, and we're using generative models. You've heard a lot about these, um, particularly today. Um, these models, they learn the distribution of the real data, and then they go on to generate synthetic cohorts. And in this case, those would be uh, synthetic transcriptomic data, um, ideally that have the same properties as the real data, but private. However, you cannot just um, synthesize new data and just because it's fake, it's not necessarily private. You have to make sure that the training process itself has privacy constraints, and that's exactly what we're doing in this project. 
So this, up until now, is uh, what I introduced last year on the poster. Now I'm going to show some results that we've um, acquired since then. So we were using a cohort. Can you see the? No. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Uh, you can see here we're using a bulk transcriptomics cohort, which has uh, different labels. Those labels are certain types of leukemia and other. Other can be healthy people, but it can also be uh, different types of diseases. We then used generative models to create synthetic cohorts and used a classifier to assess uh, how well the synthetic data uh, well, is, basically. First, a classifier was trained on real data over here and also tested on real data. It's like the baseline scenario, very high classification accuracy. Then you can see here four different models for data generation. First, in the context of generating synthetic data, but not private. Um, we trained the classifier then on the synthetic data and tested on the real data still very high classification performances, but we're not there yet, we want this to be private, so now came the private training of those generative models, and here you can see that except for the first one, um, still we remain very high classification accuracy. And then there are also some ongoing tasks at the moment, because of course we're not only interested in having good classification accuracy, but also biology. So we're looking into maintained co-expression and differential gene expression. And lastly, we want to expand this uh, to the single cell scenario. And yeah, that's it. Oh, sorry. Quickly, thank you to, to the team in, uh, in Saarbrücken from the CISPA, Mario and Dingfang, of course, Matthias and Helmholtz AI for sponsoring this or financing this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Marie. We have time for one question from the audience. Yes, there is one. Is there any mic in near there? Um, yeah, you uh, said you had some uh, constraints uh, in the training um, on yeah, to maintain privacy. Mm -hmm. Do you also um, check for privacy leakage afterwards, and if how? <laughs> so yes, good question. Um, this method on kind of sanitizing the gradients during the training process has been specifically designed to avoid the success of um, certain attack types. But um, for this particular kind of data, of course, as a kind of a proof, um, we will also check that uh, once it's done. But first, the, the bio-evaluation is a very important point on our list. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Cool, okay, thank, thank you. you again. Then we move on to the second and third second prize winners from last year. One of them is Tsung Chien from the IGSB who presented the Gestalt Matcher that was shortly after published in Nature Genetics, as we heard before. And he already gave us a half an hour long update on Gestalt Matcher, so I think we can skip this at this moment. I'm sorry, Tsung. <laughs> um, so we come to the other second prize winner from last year, and that was Miguel Ibarra, alumnus of the IGSB. He left Bonn and now moved to another city and to new exciting research projects in the Shapiro Group in Heidelberg. All the best for you in Heidelberg, Miguel. Last year, he presented I2DR, and I'm curious what he worked on during the last year. The stage is yours. Mm. How do I change this? Right. PDF is always the safer option for this type of thing, so I will just go with this one. Uh, so last year, I was working in this project, I2DR, 
and the integration uh, between the deep learning model uh, with polygenic risk score for an improved detection of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, since the, I see <laughs> very a lot of new faces and also like some ones, like the ones that are already like here, like this stack, like please hold with me. Uh, the new ones, I will just like briefly go through like a brief introduction of why we're doing this. So the motivation for improving the detection of diabetic retinopathy is diabetic ret retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness worldwide. Usually on the very early stages, it presents itself asymptomatic or like symptoms so mild that basically the brain compensates for them. So it's very hard to detect. Uh, the detection of diabetic retinopathy is actually time consuming for the uh, ophthalmologist. So there is always a need for a way in which we can um, improve the early detection of this disease. One of the ways that we are considering to do this, um, this improvement is through the uh, addition of polygenic risk scores. So in this way, we're, op uh, we're obtaining a model that is both uh, taking into account the phenotypic as the genotypic uh, characteristics for a given patient. So the first thing, as any other machine learning uh, problem, is to get the data. And for this type of things, we can go to different levels of, uh, of actually annotation. Annotation of, of the diabetic retinopathy degree, uh, the same as like some further level, which is like adjudication, consider a gold standard for this. Uh, the problem is that like usually these data sets are small in size compared to uh, the amount that you require for training a deep neural network. So to do this, uh, we develop a way in which we can use transfer learning from training on a bigger da data set, which is not necessarily rich for diabetic retinopathy, but is rich on fundus images. So we use the training um, of the main characteristics of, of the eye on a UK Biobank data set. Then we train specifically for diabetic retinopathy on Kaggle and Messidorf. And we fine tune this model uh, in the patients from UK Biobank, which contain, uh, which were uh, diabetic retinopathy, were diagnosed with diabetic retinopathy. And we took the polygenic risk score also from the UK Biobank to integrate in a meta model to obtain a better prediction. So this was the state of the project up to a year ago, currently. We were thinking we don't have to like also limit ourselves to the point in which you include only the polygenic risk score and, and the fundus of the eye. Sure, on one hand, you have the fundus of the eye as a very easy way to, uh, as a very easy like uh, data uh, entry point for all these algorithms, but the polygenic risk score, not so much. So we were also exploring uh, the option of including uh, the risk factors that a person may have. This risk factor may be sex, the age of the detection of diabetic retinopathy, uh, maybe the ethnicity, blood pressure, blood pressure, and some other factors for this. So right now, the experimental design and the way that we're trying to, to check the, the performance of this model is by comparing, uh, using simply the, uh, the fundus images, the fundoscopies plus the genetic component, and the fundoscopies plus the generating component plus the risk factors. We have already some results for the explainability of the model. Uh, we train it and we can actually see on the saliency maps on the right that they actually look at known uh, landmarks of the, of the disease of the diabetic retinopathy, usually landing in spots such as the microaneurysms or places where neovascularization is happening. Also recently, with the Sapia lab in Canada, they are also working on in, uh, the retinal cell biology and the adipose tissue biology. And they found also the molecular markers that uh, give rise to the, to the formation of the microaneurysms in the eye. So we're also trying to integrate like now these biomolecular markers plus the polygenic risk score, plus the risk factors to get a model in which like you don't have to have all of them but the more you have, the, the better accuracy you will get. This is a result from the previous year in which we can see how like just taking a deep learning model trained exclusively on UK Biobank and another one compared to UK, Bio, UK Biobank plus the polygenic risk score. 
we have like a, an increase on the accuracy on the AUC for the prediction of the diabetic retinopathy. So yeah, uh, this seems to be working. There's still work to be done, but we're getting there. So with that, I will like to finish my talk and thanks all the team and people that been like also helping me with this. Thank you very much, Miguel. We have another time for one quick question, if there is one. All right, then, thank you again. And congratulations of being Master of Science now, I forgot to mention. And I also... <laughs> right? And congratulations to Dr. Hizye as well. I forgot to mention Tsung Chen also. Okay, so um, let's get to the last winner of last year's session. Um, she will give an update on her work with her tool GenRisk. So tell us what you do when you're not organizing conferences, Anna. <laughs> All right, so hi everyone. First, I would like to thank you for not voting for my poster this year, because I got tired of people asking me if I'm rigging the votes. I really am not. Uh, but uh, let's go for the update. I'm just gonna go for uh, over my poster this year because it's basically the update. Uh, like Tori mentioned, does it do the update? Yeah. So uh, we created a. A pipeline called GenResk, and we're basically applying it. The idea of GenResk is that we wanted to um, uh, create a gene-based scores that cons that are more uh, focused on rare variants, um, and then try to first see if they contribute to uh, complex phenotypes, and uh, if they can help with a prediction of uh, of the uh, risk of having this uh, phenotype. So, to test this pipeline, we, uh, wait, I can't seem to, po uh, to point right, so, okay. So, we used uh, 100, uh, 145,000 uh, British individuals from UK Biobank, more or less, depending on the availability of the data of each biomarker. Um, we used uh, BMI, age, sex, and four principal component, genetic principal components as covariates. And then we uh, tested 28 different blood biomarkers um, that you can see on the figure, and I will point at uh, in a bit. So we calculated the gene-based scores, and as I said, these uh, scores upweight rare and damaging variants. Um, yes, using uh, GenResk. And then we did an association analysis, uh, basically the just uh, linear regression on these uh, gene-based scores. So results, stupid pointer. <laughs> okay, so um, this uh, figure basically shows the distribution of effect sizes uh, of, the, uh, of the genes uh, with B values less than 0 0.05 after FDR correction. Um, and they show basically the, the direction of the effect, either positive or negative. Um, I'll show a couple of examples where we know that these genes actually contribute to the phenotype, so that means that the gene-based scores are actually able to detect um, some kind of uh, association. For example, alkaline phosphatase, ALBL is alkaline phosphatase uh, producing gene. Um, we have also uh, bear with me. Uh, LDLR, uh, which is LDLR receptor, and how it uh, affecting cholesterol and LDR, uh, LDL uh, measurements, and um, the sex hormone binding globulin, uh, and it's uh, we identified uh, SHBG gene uh, as an associated uh, gene. So here we're just proving that the gene-based scores are actually, uh, or let's say rare variants are actually uh, contributing to um, these complex phenotypes. 
uh, now for some not novel, not so novel more than uh, a novel depending on uh, rare variants finding. For example, we have THAR, uh, THRA, which is thyroid, thyroid receptor, and its association with liver function. Um, there have been many studies um, showing that um, thyroid receptor and liver function are actually associated. Um, um, yeah, that's just one example. We are currently writing a paper with more detailed examples, um, and it will hopefully be published soon, so you can look forward to that. And thank you for listening. Rana doesn't want to take any questions. <laughs> so uh, is there any question for Rana? All right, then I'll ask for an extra round of applause for Rana, who once again <laughs> as she created a great uh, online uh, website for the conference and played a big part in organizing this meeting. So thank you very much again, Anna. So as previously promised, we now come to the most exciting part of uh, this whole conference, this year's poster award winners. And we have continued with the hybrid concept from last year and I hope you all voted online yesterday. Uh, you had time until midnight. And this year we have doubled the prices so the third prize gets 400 euros, the second prize is 800 euros, and the fir uh, first prize is a whole of 1,200 euros. Optionally payable in Bitcoin as well. Unfortunately, Wolfgang Prince is no longer here to advise what is the currently better choice. Um, then we'll see. <laughs> so this year's winner will also get a talk in the poster session next year, just as we saw it, and uh, to tell us then how things went on with their projects. So, our first winner on the podium, the winner of 400 euros or alternatively 0 0.01 Bitcoin, identified and characterized a new disease gene for severe global developmental delays. So, congratulations on your great work, Maria Azi from the Cologne Center for Genomics. Thank you so much, ACD, for selecting my poster. I'm very excited to share the story of this unknown gene, CYHR1, which was never reported with any genetic disorder before. So uh, this project started with the recruitment of uh, the Yemeni family, where three uh, members of this family were afflicted with uh, microcephaly-associated severe global developmental delay and exome sequencing identified a two base pair deletion, which causes an early truncation at protein level uh, because of the frame shift. And um, with this, we recruited another patient from Gene Matcher where there was again a two base pair deletion mutation, which causes an elongation at protein level and finally the truncation because of the frame shift. And uh, the third uh, patient, from Gene Matcher has a splice variant. And uh, first of all, I characterized the patient with the splice variant. So at uh, RNA, it shows that uh, one of the uh, transcript, uh, which is uh, formed by the mm, canonical uh, splice donor site um, uh, missions, has a uh, skipping of exon number three, which was present in the wild type mRNA. So as I said that nothing was known about CYHR1 protein, so I wanted to uh, first of all see where it is localized uh, in the cell. So uh, I transiently expressed the GFP tag CYHR1 in HeLa cells, and you can appreciate nice staining inside the nucleus, the puncta, in green. However, the uh, GFP tag mutant protein from the first patient uh, was uh, mislocalized and only small puncta were present in the cytosol. 
So as we know that the truncated proteins are usually uh, subjected to proteasomal degradation, so I um, treated the overexpressed cells with um, inhibitors of um, nonsense mediated decay as well as uh, proteasomal degradation, and we see the recovery of um, um, mutant protein in uh, both of the experiments. Um, yeah, you can appreciate the band in these Western blots. So then, um, I um, characterized uh, this protein on cellular level and stained it in different cell types. And uh, you can uh, observe that it is predominantly expressed inside the nucleus in a HeLa cell line, MCF7, and um, a neural cell line uh, from glioblastoma. Uh, however, it was uh, uh, expressed in both nucleus and cytosol in fibroblasts. So this explains that it might have uh, dual functions in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Um, and uh, you can also see that um, the, the fibroblasts derived from uh, two of the patients with a frame shift and a splice mutation uh, have a complete absence of CYHR1. So these, uh, the patient have a deficiency of this protein. So uh, to, to see where this protein lies in the proteome or in the network of proteins, my strategy was a pull-down assay coupled with mass spectrometry to find out the binding partners of this protein. And I had a list of 110 binding partners uh, which were enriched in two pathways. One was autophagy and the other was a uh, splicing major pathway. And here I am showing you the results of only uh, autophagy-related pathway. So as we know that the major player of autophagy is um, lysosomes, as it clears the proteasomally degraded proteins. But um, uh, you can see that in both of the mutants, uh, the established markers of uh, lysosomes, which is lump one and lump two, are uh, quite increased in uh, both uh, patient-derived uh, fibroblasts, which shows that uh, lysosomes are not being cleared or these are uh, regulated by the cell uh, overly because of the presence of non-degraded proteins. Then the second marker, which is P62, also showed increased uh, puncta in patient-derived fibroblasts as compared to the wild type, which shows uh, autophagic defects in uh, these patient cells. So uh, what uh, these, the autophagy deficient cells are already uh, published uh, to, be, to show uh, being sh shrunk in the literature. So I measured uh, the size of uh, mutant fibroblasts, and it was uh, significantly reduced as compared to the wild type fibroblasts. And the uh, mic electron micrographs also showed aggregation of uh, lysosomes in the cytosol of mutant fibroblasts. So further to this, uh, I wanted to analyze the global changes on transcriptome level. So uh, the patient's um, uh, RNA was subjected for whole transcriptome analysis, and uh, there we had a validation of our previous results that uh, the differentially expressed genes were related to autophagy and uh, splicing major pathway, and uh, similar was observed in the whole proteome data as well. So further, I... Um, differentiated the patient-derived fibroblasts into uh, iPSCs, but um, the mutant fibroblasts could never proceed to the, um, the initial phase or the pre-iPSCs phase. Uh, uh, however, we observed uh, quite a lot of uh, iPS colonies in the wild type. And uh, for now, I can conclude that um, when there is a shift of uh, a c one cell type to another, there has to be a, an enormous amount of uh, autophagy, uh, which a cell should first undergo to clear up the previous proteins, which is related to the previous cell type. So uh, further, we uh, characterized this uh, protein in um, the variants in the zebrafish, and uh, we could observe a brain-related phenotype in the CYHR1 uh, injected morpholinos, where the brain was uh, either uh, undergoing necrosis or was uh, extremely dysmorphic as compared to the control CYHR1. So my proposed disease model here is 
that uh, CYHR1 is a, a, a dual function protein which is responsible for autophagy and um, a splicing major pathway. And uh, the, um, the CYHR1 deficient cells would finally undergo the cell death because of uh, extremely toxic uh, condition and impairment of uh, autophagy. Uh, and thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we do not have time for questions now. And lunchtime is coming. Sure. <laughs> so thank you. Then we move on to the poster with the second most votes, with one more vote than the third winner. Uh, she introduces the tool S&P Boost, um, and she is the winner of 800 viewers or 0.02 Bitcoin. And it's Hannah Klinkhammer from IGSB. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, first of all. Uh, and yeah, thank you for voting for my poster. Maybe it was because PRS has been kind of a controversial topic this uh, conference. Um, so what I'm working on is actually on the methodology part of PRS. Um, so I'm a statistician by training. And our motivation was that PRS are usually derived by uh, genome-wide association studies, and it's just um, adding, or just, but it's adding univariate effects. Um, and for a statistician, that seems rather uncommon to not fit a multivariable model. So we wanted to do that, but of course you have this high dimensionality, so we had to come up with some approach how to actually use all the data at once. And what we are using is um, statistical boosting. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail now because I think time is running, everyone's looking for lunch. Um, but it's a machine learning approach, maybe you know gradient boosting, it's similar. And we um, adapted an algorithm and are working on batches uh, of variants. So, where is it? Ah, okay. So what we do is we compute the correlations of all the variants to our current residual or our current model. And then we choose the, let's say, 1,000 best fitting variants. And then we apply this boosting algorithm um, on this batch of variants and stop at some point and then build a new batch. And we keep on doing that until we reach a certain criterion when to stop the algorithm. Um, that's it for the technical details. So uh, this was, was already done. I think um, I presented part of it last year as well. You can find this algorithm in detail in our preprint. Um, and what we want to do now is the advantage of boosting, why we want to use it, is it's quite adaptable. So you have um, that kind of base learners, which is right now we just fit a linear regression for each variant, like it is done in um, GWAS as well. Um, but then you also have a loss function. And by varying the loss function, you can fit this algorithm to different phenotypes. So um, right now I can present you three phenotypes that we can fit already. So uh, we started with quantitative phenotypes. Uh, so it's just like linear regression. Of course, the algorithm is not, but um, you can imagine it like that. Um, so we have the L2 loss. And then we could show that our PRS could outperform GWAS-based PRS as, for example, by PRS-CS, which is shown in this figure here for LDL cholesterol. Um, and one main advantage or one main property of our algorithm is that it uh, derives sparse PRS. So we do not use all the variants, but you end up with a subset of variants. Um, and we compared it also to other multivariable models uh, like the Lasso or Base R, for example, um, and it worked quite well. So it was um, a competitive performance. And then now we extended our framework to binary phenotypes. So here you can see it for 
high blood pressure. Um, and the red line is if you just use covariates, so sex, age, and the first 10 principal components. The green line is just the PRS, so without any covariates, and uh, it might be a bit small, but if you add covariates and PRS, it's actually uh, performing better than by either just covariates or just PRS. Um, so to do that, we implemented the lock loss. So basically what we do is we um, try to fit a logistic regression setup. Yeah, and we could uh, also show here that the PRS could just dis help discriminate between controls and cases. And then maybe one um, not that common um, application is quantile regression. So basically, instead of uh, fitting the mean or the median, you can choose to fit the 25% quantile. Even though I show it here for LDL cholesterol, you can, for example, it's maybe more intuitive to think about um, BMI and to uh, find variants that are associated with being underweight or overweight. So um, this quantile regression has been there for a while, but I think, um, to my knowledge, it hasn't been applied to PRS so far. Um, so what we do is we can construct those subject-specific subject um, prediction intervals, for example, like for 25 and 75%, as is, is shown here. Yeah, I think that's it for now, and I thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We move the vivid discussion on PRS to the lunch break. And then we come to our winner of this year's AGD poster contest, the winner of 1,200 euros or 0.03 Bitcoin. It was a neck and neck race with only two additional votes for him. There is a clear winner. We're excited to hear more details about the AI behind bone to gene after Benham's great talk this morning. Congratulations, Sebastian Rassmann from IGSB. As uh, he is installing his presentation, maybe we can do a quick industrial exhibition here. We have a supermodel who presents what you can get if you go to the industrial roofs um, <laughs> in the lunch break again. <laughs> so it's worth it. We also have some other nice things uh, if you talk to our lovely industrial booths. <laughs> maybe also a little souvenir. Perfect. All right, then the stage is yours. Does it work? Ah, yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks for the giving applause. Um, thanks a lot to AGD for sponsoring the, um, the prizes um, and also for everyone to view the post and, and vote on them. Um, yeah, so as there was already kind of a briefing from, from Benham, I just want to go a bit more into detail about the bone age part of our bone to gene project. So as Benham was mentioned, uh, we are actually interested or mostly interested in uh, classifying uh, skeletal disorders and to identify the disease-causing gene in the end, just as uh, we've seen a couple of examples today already. Um, so in this part, um, we, uh, for this, we, we implemented a deep convolutional neural network. We input an image um, and just train it end-to-end -to, -end to a final prediction. Um, so um, the idea is that we don't require any human prior. We basically, we don't really know what the model should be using and what it could be using. Uh, we just let the model figure it out by itself. Um, now, coming back to the bone age part, this in the end was just a sort of a proxy task to basically pre-train a model on just getting to know some bones, figure out how, what to look at and just how they look. Um, however, um, after applying, after training on this public uh, big t t data set, we tested on the associated uh, test set and turned out that we performed uh, pretty well after some tweaks and some minor assembling of three models. Um, so we can still run this model on about, in about 10 seconds on a, on a just a normal um, computer. Um, we actually achieve a score which is um, right up state of the art. So we outperform the winner of the original competition associated with the set. We outperform a commercial tool which is in clinical use for about 10 years or more. Um, and we also outperform human raters, but I mean, that's already done like five years ago or so. Um, 
So um, after that, we basically came back to our collaborators, which were working more in the clinics, and they were quite um, impressed by the results. Um, so they asked, us, what about applying it to their data? And um, here it turns out that actually um, this also works quite nicely for um, this other patient just as well. And it's impressive given that uh, even the commercial tools which are used in routine diagnostics are not able to cope with some of these um, disorders because their bones are too abnormally shaped. So the, their systems cannot recognize the bones um, and there's no final prediction. So either the image is rejected, which is still okay, or just the model will output a wrong or rather inaccurate prediction. And um, we, we tested this first on um, just a clinical bone age that was associated with the images that were provided. There we achieved, um, not quite sure, some MAD of about seven, which is already in the range of the human rater, but we have to see that the um, crown truth we're comparing here to is rather noisy given that the rater is also not perfect. If we take a second rater into that uh, equation and just average their prediction, we can actually reduce that score. Um, and if we um, compare in our data set um, each, the performance on each individual disorder, we can actually see that the difference between two raters is greater than the difference between our model and a rater, which is quite indicative that our model is actually doing better than a single uh, human on, on this job. Um, yeah, so um, this was actually already quite nice. Um, and as a final check, we also looked a bit more into a, a practical application. So in, uh, in those disorders, what quite often happens is that there is some kind of developmental delay, which is an indication, as far as I know, to, um, for example, bone age assessment to just track the biological age and also to hormone therapies, which means that um, you need a consecutive tracking or um, longitudinal surveillance of, of individual patients. So um, as you can see here at the plot, um, if we draw such lines and follow a patient over his life and see how, they develop, uh, how the bone age develops over time, um, we can see that our model actually produces a really smooth result. And if we quantify that, we can actually show that it's as good as a clinician, it's as smooth as a clinician, so we are able to detect the same small changes, for example, in use by, by a therapy or a similar. And this is not on the poster yet, but just a spoiler for the upcoming publication. If we, um, if we uh, compare this to um, a clinician that is, has not seen the previous rating and is blinded for the previous reports, we actually by far outperforming um, a, a radiologist. So um, thanks to, to our team, uh, namely Alexander, Miguel, Benham, and Peter, who are in the audience, and the rest of our collaborators. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions if there's time left. Yeah, thank you. So maybe for the winner, there's one short question, and we are still a bit patient to go to lunch. Or we do it in the lunch break. Okay, I have a one quick, very quick question. What you're doing with your 0.03 Bitcoin, which NFT are you buying? Uh, okay. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then, uh, that were our poster prize winners. Thank you very much. Um, we move on to some other prizes. We have two more prizes, the Twitter prizes. Um, First of all, spread the word about uh, what you were winning here. So we have, uh, yeah, it, it's just worth it to uh, give your posters in here. And next year, the prize money will be increased again to 500, 1,000, and 1,500 euros. So come back next year. All right, so the Twitter prizes. Last year, I was a lucky one on the spinning wheel. This year, the tweeter with a, uh, who, who street got the most likes and the most active tweeter get prizes. So the prerequisite was to use the hashtag AGD2022. And by the way, I won the Mediblock last year. It's still worth a third of what it was last year. So <laughs> almost two cents. The prize this year is a single shoe, but a very special one, which you can make money with by moving crypto money, of course. So the tweet that got the most likes is at a great hybrid conference in Germany, to ask questions, there are these very light foam cubes with mics hooked in the AV system. If you have a question, someone will throw you the uh, cube, so good icebreaker. Well, does anyone recognize themselves? <laughs> Congratulations to our speaker from the US. Thank you very much for coming, Benjamin Solomon. 
and have fun with your step-in sneaker. And the most active treater in our second intercontinental, or second intercontinental speaker, Shahida Musa, who documented the conference for the Twitterverse. So thank you very much and well done. Congratulations. <laughs> and you have the other single shoe then. <laughs> so you can move together. So uh, let's take a photo on stage with all the winners, the poster prize winners as well as the Twitter prize winners just come to the front. And in the meantime, I uh, would like to oh, just come in front. I will just continue speaking. Um, so those of you who would like to see some more of the beautiful Bonn are invited to come to a um, walk through Bonn after the lunch snack. Also, Anna will pay a visit to the Bundeskunsthalle and is also happy to take company. So if you don't have a plan for the afternoon yet, please just come in front after the session for a brief discussion where we meet. And with that and this, with those wonderful photos, I'd like to close this year's AGD uh, here in person and also online. And thank you very much for those two very informative days with a lot of input on blockchain technology. Let's see when there will be the first talks about this topic at ASHD or ESHD. We welcome any feedback, any ideas for exciting topics for the next annual meeting. You can also give feedback through the website. And yeah, enjoy lunch and don't forget to visit the booth at the industrial exhibition. It's worth it, as we saw, right? <laughs> so thank you, enjoy lunch and see you next year. <laughs>